right. Let me take you back two years. It was 2021 and at the tiny island of Tuvalu, its foreign minister stands in the middle of the ocean and delivers his speech for the COP26 summit. The representative of the world's fourth smallest country wanted to make a point. His country was sinking and he needed help from all of us. What we knew as global warming so far has now a new name. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the era of global boiling has arrived. The air we breathe is unbreathable. All right, let's listen in to Antonio Guterres's uh, statement today. The era of global warming has ended. The era, the era of global boiling has arrived. The air is unbreathable. The heat is unbearable. And the level of fossil fuel profits and climate inaction is unacceptable. So that was the UN Secretary General speaking on the state of affairs today. But remember, the air we breathe is unbreathable, heat wave is breaking records, and climate action isn't seeing concrete results. Scientists around the world say it is all of us humans who are to blame for this disastrous situation that we are in today. The only surprise is the speed of the change. It's happening at a much faster rate. Chris Hewitt, director of the Climate Services at World Meteorological Organization, says one of the next five years will be the warmest on record. Listen in to what he said. Almost certain likelihood that one of the next five years will be the warmest on record and a 66% chance, so more likely than not, of temporarily exceeding the 1.5 degree above pre-industrial for at least one of the five years. So we're not saying permanently exceeding 1.5 degrees at this point, but more likely than not that one of the next five years will temporarily exceed 1.5. So this extreme heat, it shouldn't really come as a surprise. While in India, we are experiencing heavy rains and flash floods this monsoon, July has been the hottest month on record for most countries across the world. American President Joe Biden said heat-related deaths are more than floods hurricanes and tornadoes in America combined. Most people don't realize for years heat has been, the, I have to admit, I didn't know it either. I thought it, I, I knew it was tough, but the number one weather-related killer is heat. The number one weather-related killer is heat. 600 people die annually from its effects, more than from floods, hurricanes, tor and tornadoes in America combined. And even those places that are used to extreme heat have never seen it as hot as it is now for as long as it's been. Even those who deny that we're in the midst of a climate crisis can't deny the impact of extreme heat is having on Americans. Now, interestingly, remember the U.S. is among the biggest polluters in the world. The top seven greenhouse gas emitters are China, European Union, United States, Russia, Indonesia, Brazil and India. And amid the blame game that countries play, paying up for the damage caused by the climate challenge is also a bone of contention. We're going into COP28 this year, but in the last one, that is at COP27, a decision on establishing a dedicated fund for loss and damage was taken. How much of that has helped and which country will pay how much still remains a tussle. So when did it all begin? Let's trace back history. The average temperature of the Earth is now about 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than it was in the late 1800s, before the Industrial Revolution. Human activities have led to the last decade being the warmest on record. Amid all this, there are now new kinds of migrants in the world. Climate migrants, those who are forced to move away from their homes due to extreme weather events. The World Bank estimates that South Asia, Africa and Latin America could altogether produce 143 million internal climate migrants by 2050. Coming to India, what's the situation here? The Indian government has, with its several initiatives, tried its bit to work towards climate action. At COP26, India declared net zero emissions by 2070. 
We've also initiated uh, the International Solar Alliance, the National Hydrogen Emission Mission, and the Big Cat Alliance, among other several initiatives that have been taken. At the G20 Environment Ministerial Meeting in Chennai today, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that India achieved its installed electric capacity from non-fossil fuel sources nine years ahead of the target of 2030. But where does the buck stop? Who is answerable for all this? And will we ever be able to reverse this climate trend? To answer all of these questions and discuss much more about climate change and the crisis that we are going through, let me bring in my guests tonight. I'm joined by Professor Mark Howden, who's the Vice Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and he's also the Director, Institute for Climate Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University. In fact, he was also part of the IPCC team that won the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you very much, Professor Howden, uh, to be coming here on Mirror Now. We're also joined by Deepak Dasgupta, Distinguished Fellow at Terry, an IPCC author, Synthesis Report 2023. Welcome to you as well. And Abhinash Mohanty, climate scientist and global sector head at Climate Change and Sustainability, IPE Global, also joins us tonight. Welcome to you as well. All right. Uh, first, let me come to you, uh, Professor Howden. You know, um, those days of uh, us seeing a polar bear on a very small piece of uh, ice in Antarctica have gone. Those were the initial days when we started seeing images and warning signs of climate change and climate crisis. But at the cost of sounding alarmist, let me first ask you, are we at the tipping point already? Not really. Um, what we are is on a long and steady trend uh, to increase temperatures globally. And what we've seen is that that's already having very significant consequences locally. Um, the the point that you make about uh, some time ago seeing polar bears on ice, um, that's changed to the images you see on screen, uh, the, the fires and the heat waves, um, the floods and the damage that is being caused to our environment and our societies. And, and I think that's a really important change. Most people haven't actually ever seen a polar bear. They don't know it's not part of, they don't know about them. It's not part of their local, you know, regular experience. But the things you're showing on TV are part of the regular experience. And that's what really matters to people, the, the lived experience in terms of climate change. And, and unfortunately, at the moment, we've got our foot firmly on the greenhouse gas accelerator. Uh, we're not stopping that. Last year was record emissions broke the previous year, which was also record emissions, et cetera. And it's only when we take those greenhouse gas emissions down to net zero that we'll actually stop the increase in temperatures that we're seeing. All right, uh, Abhinash, you know, we've been having these concerns of the fact that we are pushing that threshold of the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, with each passing day, in fact. Help us understand, as Professor Howden said, that you know, the visuals and the images and the scenes that we see nowadays are more relatable. They are more nearer to us. Climate change is impacting all of us in our daily lives. If that 1.5 degree threshold is pushed, what happens? Uh, let me start with numbers. Good evening, Shreya. And uh, of course, this is not good with what visuals we are seeing here. It's a mayhem, right? And let me put numbers into perspective from India side, because we are in a Indian news channel, national news channel. So 75% of Indian hotspots are extreme event hotspots. Districts are extreme event hotspots. And more importantly, 40% of them, that means three quarters of them and 40% of these uh, extreme event hotspots are showcasing a swapping trend. That is traditional flood prone areas are becoming drought prone. And that's uh, awful. Our cities, somewhere it is scorching heat. So somewhere it's like flooded, inundated, and it's it's a mayhem, right? Uh, it's it's complete chaos. Our our kind of metropolis cities are not becoming livable anyway. Now, what does this means for each of us, right? Um, first of all, if 1.5 isn't controlled, and and the numbers that I have stated is actually an uh, resultant of 1.1 degree, not even 1.5, and it's a mayhem. Uh, if 1.5 is bridged, then what is going to happen not just across India or South Asia, which is kind of globally very vulnerable, 
But importantly, what is going to happen is our lives, livelihood, and our economic sectors are going to be impacted by the largest extent. Again, numbers into perspective, 4.5% of our GDP is going to be lost only because of heat wave. If we don't uh, restrict 1.5% of our uh, temperature rise, then what's going to happen is um, our economic sectors are going to be pushed by two decades. And more importantly, what is going to happen is some of the climate-sensitive sectors like agriculture, tourism, so on and so forth, are going to be impacted by the largest impact. Uh, I mean, by the largest extent. And then what's going to happen is uh, the aspiring young India and the global south, which is kind of becoming the poster boy for the world, uh, where the world is looking up to for solutions, is going to be impacted to be uh, for the best of the uh, largest impact. So what we are going to try is going to try and find out our alternatives. And in a way, I am very sorry to say that that uh, within the climate domain, we speak about a lot of innovations. We actually don't need innovations anymore. What we need is real finance, and especially we don't need innovative financing. What we need is actually money in order to climate-proof our lives, livelihood, economies, and more importantly, fix our freezer landscapes so that some extent of the damage which has been done can be retrieved, can be put into perspective, number one. Number two, uh, what we need to more importantly do is understand the evolving risk landscape at different scenarios, 2100, 2050. Uh, Professor Howding just said about uh, the scenario the IPCC has been working. 2050, 2100 scenarios are very good, but what is going to happen now and then? Because every phase, it's a dynamic thing which is happening. We know uh, with evolving risk landscape, it's, it's going to evolve like anything devastating our lives and livelihood. So we need to have hyper-granular mapping of hazard, yeah. risk, and vulnerability yeah. at a much more granular level. And that's where uh, the bug is going to start. Third, uh, we can't shift our goalpost anymore. Developed countries trying to shift the goalpost into developing countries, developing countries trying to shift the goalpost with these economic aspirations. There has to be a balance. And just sifting uh, goalposts, sure. we are going to probably take more 30 editions of um, conference of parties to come down into any consensus. Whatever is promised, it is need to be brought into sure. the table. The vulnerable countries are already facing it. Countries are facing existential crisis. And before it breaches uh, all the thresholds that we have, whatever retrieval limit is there, we need to stop there and start getting into real action sure. rather than just sifting gold first. Yeah. Okay. All right. Deepak Das Gupta, um, you know, Abhinash uh, brought in the developed versus developing tussle that we have uh, witnessed, unfortunately, during this climate crisis and we need see the blame game playing out. Uh, but before I get into the climate financing part of it, I want to understand from you since you're joining us from Washington, D.C., um, you know, uh, in terms of doables, in terms of the, the fact that every step, every action of ours contributes uh, to climate crisis, to climate action, how do you see the difference between U.S. and India, between a developed and a developing country? Um, so here is, I think, where we are. I, the, the, the amount of action that's being undertaken in the developed countries, uh, I would say are encouraging, but we are nowhere near where they need to be. So the gap between uh, promises and actions remains as wide, if not wider, than even maybe three, four years ago. So we, we keep hearing a lot of action, but as you travel across the countries, and I've just been all over Europe, and I've been all over America, North America, Canada, US, uh, you just simply don't see the level of pickup of aggressive climate actions that have been promised for a very long time. And it's, uh, it's a mix of things that's happening. I think governments are aware that they need to do more. I think that's, that's fair that most governments in uh, developed uh, countries, as well as in, of course, in developing countries, I think the pressure is on them. They understand that they need to do more. 
and they are taking some uh, actions on their government side, policy side, budgetary announcement side, the Biden action plan. These are all uh, uh, very good announcements, and these are also being implemented. Unfortunately, I think the gap between where these uh, actions and announcements are taking place versus what's happening in the, on the ground in terms of um, a, any metrics uh, on mitigation measures is far, far below what we need. Uh, the scale and pace of action is a far, far below what they're capable of and what they need to do. And that's really a private sector failing. And the private sector failing is, is multiple. Uh, the financial sector in the private sector in, in continues to finance uh, the fossil fuel industries in a great, great, far greater amount than we would expect them to at this stage. They're simply mm. not recognizing the risks. So stock markets don't carry news about climate. They carry news about what's the rates of return on the existing ways of life. And, unfor and that's unfortunate. So uh, I would say the gap between yeah. rhetoric and reality is extremely high in all developed countries. And it's something that is almost unshakable. We can't seem to get, and part of the reason is when the extreme uh, heats happen, when the extreme fires happen, they tend to be confined geographically in still smaller parts of the world. And, and, and that's where the acute crises are. The crisis has not affected across the length and breadth of these economies. And therefore, the reaction of the private sector uh, tends to be muted. They don't respond. And we are left wondering hmm. what would it take. Okay. Hmm. Professor Howden, you know, this is exactly what, um, you know, my next question was. And I keep wondering why we don't see a strong behavioral change on ground. I mean, we've been talking about climate crisis. Governments have been meeting, declaring, making announcements, uh, and we are seeing the impact of it. But is it uh, complacency? Is it lesser awareness? Or is it just the fact that it hasn't uh, reached uh, probably one particular person? That's why I don't see she or he acting upon it. Uh, to me, it's a couple of things that's happening. One is that, uh, you know, we are... Uh, we Deepak, are, Deepak we are, I'll come back to you. This was for Sorry. Professor Howden. Okay. Sorry, I'll ask, I'll ask Mark to respond. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, Professor thanks Howden, for the question, Shreya. Um, that I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And, and some of it is that people uh, understand intellectually uh, that there's a, a problem here, um, but don't necessarily have the means, uh, the, the finance or the technology or the understanding or perhaps the social support to actually take significant action. Um, sometimes there's policies which need to be changed. Uh, so policies around, say, renewable energy uh, adoption. Um, and until they come in, people are reluctant because of the upfront cost of going uh, renewables by putting solar panels on your house, for example. Um, similarly, things like electric vehicles, even though there's lots of benefits from electric vehicles, it's actually cheaper to run in the long term. Um, there's a very significant entry uh, barrier because of the price, the new price of an electric vehicle. So there's lots of reasons why um, we don't see the uptake. Um, but I actually think there is hope uh, that we can uh, deal with this much more effectively than we uh, have seen in the past. Uh, so, for example, where I live in Canberra in Australia, uh, we've already gone 100% electric and more. Um, so the reason why I say more is that because we're not only supplying the electricity that we use now in our homes and uh, in our transport system with the light rail, um, but we've also got extra capacity to empower the electric vehicles and uh, move from gas-fired heating to um, electric heating, etc. So there's a very strategic approach to uh, going to renewables, uh, which opens the door to further adoption of renewable and low emission activities. So thinking strategically about this, putting in place the appropriate policies that enable people to take change and putting in place the social mechanisms, the support mechanisms that encourage people to change can actually be very effective. And we have seen good examples of that. So it's not all hopeless. Right. 
Yeah. Professor Howden, you know, I would also like uh, uh, for you to make us understand and for viewers who are, who are watching this uh, and perhaps they are still, they probably are not convinced or, you know, they just feel that what would uh, my action or one particular person's action affect and bring about the change that we need for climate action and we need to deal with climate uh, change. Uh, you know, every small bit counts, but uh, is it that impactful that we see a visible change on ground? Oh, sorry, was that directed at me, Shreya? Yes, yes, Professor Houghton. Okay. Um, look, I, I, every bit does count, and, and the things we do in our daily lives uh, can we can do often do uh, with a much lower greenhouse footprint, and we can do in ways that don't expose us so badly to climate extremes. Um, so, for example, we can look for shade and shelter, make sure that we've got good uh, water supply and, and drink plenty of water when it's hot and those sorts of things. But really important to not take sort of approach this as a only an individual action and individual response. Um, as individuals, we're part of the solution, but a big part of the solution is the companies. Um, and uh, we already heard uh, Professor talk about that. It's the governments and the government policies which support change. Uh, and so really important for individuals who are concerned about climate change to push up into industry, to push up into government, asking for more change and faster change. All right, uh, Abhinash Mahanti, you know, your body of work uh, also includes that revolving around coastal climates, their sustainability, their resilience. I want to understand from you the kind of impact climate change has on marine biodiversity. I mean, we've seen examples of coral bleaching. We've also seen, um, you know, sea life being washed ashore or just, uh, you know, large migrants of sea life uh, going from one place to the other. Uh, what sort of impact are we seeing on marine biodiversity and why is that why is it important and how does it affect us as humans? Sure, I hope you ask this question for me. Yes, yes, Abhinash, yeah. this is for you. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me uh, understanding the natural ecosystems within the coastal um, uh, line is very important because they are not just an ecosystem service provider, but they are actually the soccer observers. Coral reef, mangroves are actually soccer observers. And again, I'll try to put down into numbers so that it becomes easy for us to understand. If there is a cyclone of 200 kilometer per hour or a, or a very high intensity of cyclone that's going to happen, and you have got um, almost uh, 1,000 square kilometer of mangroves, then the impact is going to come down by 30%, right? And when I say very high intensity cyclone, we are talking of a cyclone that had hit uh, sometime back in 1999 Odessa. Uh, recently, there was Chokche. There were so, uh, so many devastating cyclones that have happened. So mangroves, especially the coastal ecosystem service providers, whether it is uh, uh, mangroves or coral reefs, so on and so forth, are kind of natural soccer observers. And then the question comes down into the marine biodiversity. While marine biodiversity is very important because they complete the loop of our ecosystem services where we get cleaner air to breathe in, uh, somewhere cleaner air, uh, cleaner water to drink, and more importantly, our microclimates are being considered by them. So marine biodiversity are the lifelines, and especially for a country like India, or many countries within the global south, what is the larger impact factor is that our economies are being driven. Our ports, our, our waterways kind of drive our economy by more than 30, 35%. And largest of the infrastructures have been built around that, but not at the cost of uh, kind of uh, di devastating our marine ecosystems or marine life, um, lives to be very precise. So marine biodiversity conservation is not just an impact of, uh, not just has an impact of providing natural ecosystem services or kind of acting as a soccer observer, but they are the lifeline of our economic um, wagon wheel. And 
because we are aspiring countries and we focus more um, in terms of conserving and first tracking our climate actions, but at the same time, our conservation and biodiversity, at least India's uh, thought leadership has been well established across the world, um, marine biodiversity plays multifaceted role. And in order to uh, conserve marine biodiversity, we have got ripple benefits, and the ripple benefits is somewhere goes between one is to seven ratio. So every one dollar spent on marine biodiversity conservation mm. will actually feature benefits worth seven dollar, and that's huge, right? Uh, so marine biodiversity is okay. very important. Coastal livelihoods are very important because more than forty five percent of of our vulnerable com uh, communities are kind of residing across um, the coastal uh, regions. And more importantly, these coastal communities yeah. are also drawing up solutions which are homegrown, local laid. And that's where the crux is happening, uh, talking about vulnerability or risk or about cutting down emissions at an industry level, at a national level is different, but at a community level, at a district level, at a village level is something different. And that's where the real action needs to be there and the real vulnerability or the risk can be mitigated. So I'm glad that you put in the coastal communities, mm -hmm. coastal communities um, in terms of climate proofing them and in terms of national averages, while 75 or uh, three quarters of our uh, districts are extreme event hotspots, 85% of coastal districts are extreme event hotspots and more than 90% of these districts yeah. are showcasing a cascading or compounding impact. Because compounding impact means uh, if, you are ma if you are flood prone or cyclone prone, you end up managing drought as well. You end up managing um, coastal inundation as well. And more importantly, sea level rise is a big elephant in the room because we have got a thin sheet of uh, ice that's available for us. So it's, it's a compounding impact and we need yeah. to understand yeah. it okay. and treat it as an emergency, Shreya, and can concur more with what Professor Howden has said yeah. and what uh, Dr. Deepak Das Gupta has also said. Right. Deepak Das Gupta, you know, in here in India, we have seen, um, you know, some areas this monsoon getting excess rainfall. We also have more predictions of heavier rainfall in many areas. But we've also seen regions where there is, uh, you know, lesser rainfall or probably drought conditions. And over the last few years, we have seen uh, very erratic uh, patterns of uh, whether it's the monsoon season or the heat wave. In fact, this year, uh, you know, uh, within the family, we've been talking about how summer was very short and whatever it was, it was not as hot as it has been earlier. Monsoons came in very early. So, you know, how do you explain this kind of erratic uh, season pattern? And is there a way to sort of predict it earlier, which way it's going to go? Um, I think the right answer is that it's all par for the course. This is exactly what one would expect. You're going to see more volatility. Uh, you're going to see volatility in weather. You're going to see differences across zones much greater. You In India, we had an early heat wave in March, if you recall. And, we, and right now we are seeing drought conditions in the eastern part and excess rainfall in the northern and western parts. So these are happening not just in, in, in India, it's happening globally, because as the energy systems pick, pick up the heat, the effects are going to be more volatile, more intense uh, 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 variations in weather that we're beginning to see. So nothing surprising. The only surprise, it's not really a surprise, we are also in the midst of the El Nino uh, conditions, and that exacerbates these conditions. So very much expected, uh, very much in tune with what we were expecting, happening faster because of the El Nino right now. Uh, that's that's the impacts that we've already crossed 1.5 C uh, peak, peak, uh, peak uh, temperatures, global warming this year, we will cross it uh, almost surely as the WMOs uh, 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 forecasting, and it's already happening, but nothing that uh, is really surprising in terms of both the intensity and the frequency of extreme events and their variability across the globe. Nothing surprising at all. 
in fact, the surprise is on the downside, that it's much worse uh, and, and possibly the only uh, 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 the only silver lining, if there's any in this, is that it gives it's giving an early signal and early warning to everyone around the world. And 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 right now, I think it is fair enough to 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 say that there are two big divides that we have not yet crossed. The two big divides that we need to understand and appreciate is that where the impacts happen, the, the impacts are, are severe and long-lasting and, and causes these losses, which are not just temporary, but losses which are uh, long duration. And therefore, uh, that's a divide between those uh, who are unaffected and those who are affected. This divide is a natural one. So the sooner we feel uh, that these conditions affect us, potentially every one of us, the better off we will be. Exactly the same uh, issue arises yeah. with respect to nation states. Unfortunately, we tend to think about we negotiate matters, quote unquote, negotiate matters of climate on the basis of nation states and not as the basis of uh, human society as a whole. And that's a tragedy. This tragedy that you're seeing, mm. the variations that we're seeing, okay. we need to really we ha have the capability to be able to do uh, uh, 10 times more, and yet we still keep doing exactly the mm. wrong things. And we end up with negotiations and discussions that really boil down to very minor differences, whereas the facts mm. that are unifying us should be far more urgent and far more uh, and uh, dramatic, yeah. and that's not happening. And, 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 I, okay. and our fear, uh, at least uh, from a scientific community's fear, is that we are simply not understanding the scale and uh, the nature. And, and I, I would like to be optimistic, mm. as Mark says, but unfortunately, I cannot be. When I walk into mm. these meetings and I come out of these meetings, it's not that gives anyone any sense of optimism. Thank you. Mm. OK. All right, Professor Howden, uh, you know, I want to also talk about something that is probably not talked about much when we talk about climate crisis, but it is one of the most crucial points uh, and changes that has come in with climate challenge, and that is uh, that of the climate migrants. And uh, mm -hmm. among those who are displaced, and this is according to the UN human rights body, 80% of those who are climate migrants are women, which in turn leads them to being, uh, you know, at risk of sexual violence, children being at risk of human trafficking, and of course, families being displaced and broken. Uh, how, how, how bad is this impact around the world? Um, was that for me again? Uh, sorry, I, could, I couldn't hear your reference to me. But uh, I'll yes, assume it Professor is. Yes, Professor Howden. Um, Look, it's a, it's already a problem. Um, people are already uh, um, seeing uh, issues of climate as part of the reasons why they um, are migrating. It's not necessarily the only reason. Um, so oftentimes we see uh, multiple things happening which cause people to to um, shift uh, where they live, and so it may be uh, economic problems. It may be uh, wars uh, and 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 social disruption, uh, it may be diseases and similar things. And so, so there can be multiple reasons uh, that also add, you know, add to um, climate stresses. One of the challenges, as you quite rightly put, is that um, when people move um, and, and migrate, is that there's, there's, they're often vulnerable, uh, and particularly women and children are very vulnerable. Uh, they're often uh, very resource poor, so they haven't got a lot of resources they've left that from the place that they've come uh, and they're very uh, um, dependent on uh, the systems in those countries where they migrate to or those locations they migrate to and often they're simply overwhelmed because of the sheer volume of people uh, that are needed needing help so so there's a whole range of things we need to do and one of the really important things to do is to try to address the problems in the country of origin of the people so it's not uh, looking for at the at the um, place that they go to, but it's the place that they come from. And so that's 
fixing up those governance issues, the the policy issues, the um, infrastructure issues. Um, it's providing help so that they can adapt to climate change. It's providing them social security so they can actually um, develop uh, jobs uh, that they can um, ensure that their children get educated so they can uh, source health uh, care, et cetera. So solving the problems in the location where people start from is the first really important thing. Um, and as others on this call have talked about, really reducing the risks of climate change by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is also a critical thing to do. So we just need to find ways to get the things that we want, the food that we eat, the water that we use, the transport that we need, but with a much, much lower greenhouse gas footprint than we currently do. Okay, quickly before I wrap this discussion of Professor Howden to you, my last question, how do you see the developed versus developing tussle in terms of climate action, in terms of climate finance? What's the way forward? Well, firstly, we need to recognise that this is a global problem and we need global solutions. Uh, just dividing it up into a blame game, which is it's their problem, uh, it's not ours, we're not causing the problem. The reality is, as human beings, we all produce greenhouse gas emissions through our normal activities, through the food we eat, um, the houses that we have, uh, the water that we drink. Um, the truth, though, is that some people um, produce a lot, lot more greenhouse gases than others. And so there's a big degree of inequity there. And that's a big part of the developed versus developing country issues, that inequity in terms of impact on the uh, broader environment. So what we need to do there is actually for those people who are wealthy in wealthy countries, um, find ways for them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions individually and as a society very, very quickly. In those um, developing countries where there's a legitimate uh, uh, interest in developing uh, their livelihoods and, and improving their life, we need to find ways to leapfrog the old ways of doing things. We don't have to go through a dirty industrial development process to end up with good living standards. We can go through a much cleaner industrial process. We know how to do that now. We don't, that's just like, you know, you don't have to go through the um, uh, the old uh, phone line system, the landline system to have modern communications. You can leapfrog that straight into mobile phones and internet-based uh, communication systems. So thinking about um, different development pathways which are much cleaner and greener and sustainable um, than the ones we have had in the past. Now, of course, um, we've already had mention of climate finance uh, and the need to boost up that finance and improve finance. So, for example, uh, clean developments uh, can have yeah. a much lower interest rates uh, than they currently would have. So supporting um, those developments through effective finance mechanisms is a really important uh, component. And we should never, ever forget that this is a long-run issue. This is going to last for many decades, and that means we need to be educating um, the children sure. of today so that they're able to cope with the world of tomorrow much more effectively um, that's the world they're going to live in. There's a recent study uh, which showed that, that a child born today is likely to suffer at least three to four times as many extreme climate events as their grandparents. And in some places, that was more than a dozen times more extreme. Okay. All right, Professor Howden, I'm afraid... Uh... I'm afraid I'll have to wrap this discussion up here, but, uh, you know, we can have as much discussion as we want to. It all comes down to what we do on our, in our daily lives, the small steps that contribute to climate action and battling this climate challenge that we're all in right now. We're wrapping it up here. I'm going to thank my guests, Professor Mark Howden, Deepak Das Gupta and Abhinash Mahanti. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and sharing your perspective on this uh, climate crisis that the world is witnessing. Well, with that, uh, we are slipping into a break. News and updates continue on the other side. Thank you very much.